Atomic Heart is an occasionally frustrating, often enticing, frequently surprising, but consistently interesting dive into what would happen if a non-Western developer attempted their own Bioshock. And to me, it's one of the most enjoyable, weird, and oddly fun games this year. Thanks to Focus for early review code. Subscribe if you want a chance to win the game. The first 1,000 comments will be the first 1,000 comments. Atomic Heart wears its inspirations, namely Bioshock, Prey, and other immersive sim games on its shoulder, or as an entire coat, depending on what part of the game you're playing. Where the subtlety of Bioshock was the descent into one man's madness at trying to achieve the perfect utopia, and then in Infinite, the misleading theatrics and even dismantling of a utopia, that isn't Atomic Heart. It does the same thing, but from a very different standpoint. And trust me, a standpoint where the utopia isn't even close to what a lot of Western audiences may think it is. It's an alternative history Russia. A scientist creates a material that basically puts Russia on the forefront and on the fast track for discovery and labor, robotics, energy, and technology. On the eve of the newest technological invention, everything goes haywire, and it's up to you, P3, a war veteran, to go in and clean up the mess and figure out what's happened. Atomic Heart plays not only with the alternative reality, but AI minds, the idea that more mundane technologies might split off into their own tech tree, like a 4X game, and yet still hit the same benchmarks, offering a different style of the internet and artificial intelligence and neural minds in the form of the collective 2.0 mixing man and machine, but the man is usually lost to the machine. Now the reflection of communism, the thoughts of the individual being less important than the group already, means that P3 sees the loss and the progress for the entire worldview and not one individual person, which is usually the cornerstone of many of these stories and makes you feel the difference right away. There's a provocative thought experiment when playing this game, both narratively and in the demonstration, in these dual moments, hitting you here or there with one-liners, secondary comments, and environmental audio to show you where the world is is and what some massive moment in the world might mean to you later on, but might also mean to the entire nation. And that heaviness absolutely helps. That connection that you have, even though it would appear you don't have it, is one of the best parts of the game. And the game design stretches those moments of wonder explorations just a bit longer than audiences are probably accustomed to. The intro to this world, for instance, and the next intro, and then the third intro are profound profoundly beautiful, easily in many ways equal to the moments of first scene rapture. But their intros, the introductions, they happen at a different directed pace, perhaps more on rails when we see it in other games. Here, a little bit more freeform, even in the way that the camera's used. Atomic Heart lets these moments sink in as you listen to Russian radio during your descent into the world. But at exactly that same time, the story is rising up around you. And the two meet exactly at the last moment of the cutscene. This dichotomy and then a symmetry and joining that isn't lost on even the most jaded gamer like me. I can't easily explain that full opening. You'll have to see it for yourself. How much it can get your mind going. It reminds me of some of the better games openings that we've seen. Like the best fictions, though, portraying alternative realities, the transparency in which we experience our own worlds still slightly colors the experiences in the games, offering motive and foundation to P3's story, to the changing world that you experience, causing you to move into each moment, to start to feel for them, to transfer your own experiences into this pocket-like memory where it feels almost like a past experience, a misremembered time in your own life. Atomic Heart actually does that in the story, with each story bit and cutscene and new enemy type building up alternative history. In conclusion about the story, Immersive Sims and their pacing reminds me a bit of rap styles, Eminem to E-40, Bone Thugs and Harmony, or even someone like Lamar. They come out with their own speeds, and in nationalities of the creators, it's impacted the same way in games. You can feel it from start to finish in the pacing of Atomic Heart and in the combat and exploration. Combat feels good in some places and not so good in others. The shotguns, the laser guns, some of the up-close weapons that you get and feel, they appear fine, but there's a little bit of a softness to them. Now, you do have a number of upgrades and crafting systems with ingredients you get around the game world. Stunningly, the crafting and collecting system is handled via psychic power, which means you don't have to go to every single cabinet and structure, but instead, like Magneto searching a room, spinning around, looking for screws, you grab all of the collectible items. It's awesome and works incredibly well to reflect the reality of P3 as a character. Comboing moves, weapons, and platforming, and then going in and being able to easily just remove all the collectibles in a room by spinning in a circle and searching more quickly is a deft touch. 
But that combo's not so much. If a first-person shooter game is going to meet the very basics of its named criteria, then shooting it should have. And while Atomic Heart has some, it's the enemies that at first in the game don't do so well. The robotic cyborg enemies, dead-faced and wide-eyed. They have an iRobot Apple kind of wrong look to them. That's cool. The appearance of a mannequin made by someone who didn't quite have a good picture of a human being is haunting. You haven't questioned humanity until you've been face-to-face with a doughy-eyed 1970s porn stash outfitted robot, but some of their attack animations are pretty bad. They just don't look that good, and it takes a couple hours of gameplay for better ones to appear. The combat's not terrible, but it progressively gets better with new enemy types and it's just those first moments when fighting those robots it never feels exactly right until you realize why you're facing those robots in those particular areas and why it changes later on also, while the up-close combat's serviceable, it's also not amazing. Some hits on enemies seem a bit farther away than they actually should be, or miss when you feel like they should hit. With dodges being the best part and the best way to get out of the way of power attacks that enemies can use to knock you down. Combat's at its best when it's visceral, when flesh meets bone and sometimes metallic flesh. Enemies, mechanical, biological, and biomechanical, thrown themselves at you like shoes for sabotage, and your single spinning, chewing gear, fighting them back. Atomic Heart looks like a 1955's Russian Bioshock, a mixture of the basic design so known by the Soviet Union and the bloc countries, but warped through the lens of strangely advanced futuristic technology, and its inventor who, at the very least, at first blush, sees for the betterment of society. It is a beautiful looking game, but it's a mutt. Tracing its lineage may be a bit difficult when you start to play it. A little bit Stalker, Metro, Bioshock, each one leaving a mark on the end result graphically. But Munfish has made sure to make it its own thing. Occasionally, graphically, it can be such a mix that it appears ungainly, a cute puppy run of a game, a bit clumsy, but already showing signs of something finer. That can also show up in some of the weapons when firing. They can result in a moment where you watch what happens and you think to yourself, what the hell? Then you upgrade it and you're like, I get it. The powers at play have a Bioshock feel, which makes sense created from more than a few lovers of the original game creating this one. As they level up, they do more and more with each ability slightly adjusting, freezing, electrifying enemies, dropping them from the sky, being able to dash through a battle location like Nightcrawler. The unevenness does rear its head here graphically, lack of detailed textures here and there, and later locations that seem a bit out of place And let's discuss performance. The game has a number of settings and also supports DLSS 3 for frame generation if you have the proper NVIDIA card for it. You'll notice things like fire extinguishers every 20 feet in some spots, which can look ungainly and cumbersome. And then at the second moment, you'll jump into a room and you'll see this awe-inspiring moment where you can tell this was a laboratory where some of the most crazy experiments were done, but they were done with an idea of bettering society even while losing a little bit of their humanity. Also, yes, the game does cash its shaders prior to that first play, and it does seem to do so after any patch. I did notice that there were some stutters here or there, even with the 3080 as well as the 4090, but with the 4090 with frame generation, it sort of went away. This is a game that does require a lot from the system, but has a lot of settings, and you're going to want to jump in and turn some of them down, because at times, the draw distance in this game is insane, its design and its requirement on your hardware's commensurate. There's a feeling of imbalance, of a need for some room or location to see just one more look or one more pass of polish. Or when you notice the unevenness when walking at the slowest speed possible and you're using the gamepad, you'll notice your character runs in place like Richard Simmons warming up for a talk show spot. But it's where the ideas shine and where the fiction plays out that really captured my imagination. For example, after the incident that causes everything to collapse, the liquid invention that led to all of these problems fills some rooms and locations. And when you swim through it, it lets you enter the liquid and hear the memories there that play out of the people who were around it when it happened, bound psychically to the liquid like grooves in a record player, but hear the bubbles and ripples on the liquid as you swim through it. It could also be easy to see the excellent parts and ignore the problems, which the game does have when it comes to polish, or ignore the good parts and just see the bad. A question that's continued about this game is exactly what is it? Is it open world? Is it open city? The game has more of the reminders of a stalker in the first moments that feel like the middle moments of other games with the exploration turning from twisted tunnels and platformers to hub, then open city, then almost open world hours into the game, especially if you want to explore and find more of the side story and puzzles and challenges. Just how long and how big? I have 41 hours in the game. And it's not 100% when it comes to the challenges and puzzles. 
It's much closer to a Far Cry and a Stalker, but without the consistent collectibles. It holds a more utilitarian storytelling of the Metro and Stalker games without the forced narrative and consistent moment-to-moment. Here, you got something that we see in a lot of AAAs. While playing Atomic Heart, I was reminded of a game years ago called Boiling Point, Road to Hell, and its sequel, White Gold. They were not great games, but their entire feel was different. But Atomic Heart is actually much tighter as a game than those two could ever be. And that's reflected in the gameplay, the way the AI works, how stealth works or doesn't work in some places. The game's pacing feels very different depending on the exact way in which you play it. Something that I think is reflected in a lot of immersive sims anyway, but even more so here. But wrapping up this gameplay section, I can tell you that the differences that we get in the presentation, even the problems with polish and the problems with combat, Atomic Heart continued to pull me through it. And strangely enough, just to overuse this cliche, it does have a lot of heart. Speaking of heart, let's talk about Mick Gordon and music. He's the heart and soul of many games, and his music works here as well. It's unique, it's eclectic, and as awesome as you would assume it would be for Mick Gordon, but it is delivered in a weird way. Chords wickedly pronounced throughout the entire battle, raging in and out during the busier moments, separating themselves from the action only rarely, and then you get these discordant mixes, and then classic old century Russian propaganda. Ambient musical points and occasional stingers keep you consistently informed, but also at the same time, always on edge. The soundtrack goes all over the place, but somehow still solidly stays exactly where it should be. From classical arrangements everybody should know to bits and pieces that will be heard for maybe one or two times in the game, but remembered for a long while after. I love this soundtrack. It might be very difficult to listen to outside of the actual game itself, which isn't necessarily something that is unusual for Mick Gordon stuff, but I dig the soundtrack. This is just awesome. And speaking of awesome, voice. For the most part, these are good. From the characters inhabiting the city you hear talking about the future and the past, about the issues within the game world that echo the feelings of pride and yet a subtle worry that can come across, to the characters you meet later that fall apart or are held up by one another, even the main character, a one-line spewing imaginative rift between Duke Nukem and Bad Lieutenant. There's some imbalance here, though, reminding me of the graphical elements once again, where polish is there in spades, but you come across these moments or characters that don't hit, and their inflection on a question or a sentence seems as if it's not there at all. For the most part, it is. While the storytelling's fine in Atomic Heart, there is a lot of information given about the story while you are trucking around. It can be incredibly difficult to parse what a character's saying when you're in the middle of facing down some homicidal saw-wielding robot that looks like an ostrich. That has happened a couple times in this game where I had to go back and listen again to some kind of sound recording or something like that to sort of get a little bit of that story because the character's just yakking. There's also some lack of polish when it comes to the voices and you do doing any discussion. If you accidentally choose the wrong part of a discussion and you've already heard it before and you want to skip it, when you do, the game has very bad mixing between the prior sentence and the next sentence and ends up having a little bit of a pop, almost an audio glitch there. It's something that they can easily patch, but I just wanted to point it out. And one last thing I have to point out, there is a crazed sales robot that is going to cause a lot of people to rock back on their heels in this game. The banter back and forth, almost entirely by the way from the bot towards the main character, is rough, harsh, oddly paced, and very, very sexual. I thought it was hilarious because it was so different and so surprising, and I will remember that character for years, but I can see a lot of people putting their pinky up and being like, oh, how dare they say these things? You really do have to identify who's saying what in these two conversations, but it will end up being a point that when it happens, you're probably going to be like, wow, they said that. Going away from speaking at all, let's talk a little bit about the sound. This is hit and miss for me, and I wasn't incredibly in love with it. The more interactive elements that you'll find in the audio department here in the game have difficulty getting through to your ears. Your time is spent checking and balances and volumes in the audio options, and it will directly reward you with a better game if you do. In the more enclosed areas, they're fine, but it's also seemed to be mixed oddly. The game has a number of options, like I said, and I suggest you spend some time identifying what audio you want where. Environmental sound effects versus the main sound effects, and it actually took me a while to get those leveled out. While I wasn't disappointed with the gun sounds, the later weapons you get do sound better. The early weapons you start with 
aren't necessarily as impactful as I would like. But when it comes to the sound, it was difficult to nail it down. Didn't really feel like it was doing a very good job giving me information on what I was doing right in front of me. It was like a little bit distance compared to really what it should be. Environmentally, I would have also liked just more variation. You can definitely hear the different robots and different creatures coming to attack you from very far away and track them pretty easily. While the sound samples that they did use are varied themselves, I would have liked more and I would have liked it to just be tightened up a bit. How does all this come together? Was Atomic Heart fun? And I think we have to look at fun as a combination of either true excitement rewarded by result or just interest paid back via subject matter. Atomic Heart has its issues with polish. It's also one of the most enjoyable, interesting, odd, and fun games I've played in a long time. It's Atomic Heart having both of those sections of fun. For every bad platforming section, because man, I do not like jumping in platformers usually, and this one definitely didn't elevate that, and it's terrible dash button, then there's some odd puzzle with a quirk of thought process that I actually liked, or some new story element. Later on, the combat gets better, and that curve is, strangely enough, right in line with the title itself. And gone are the days of a ton of unlocks up front, be aware of that. Exploration can also be enjoyable, even at its most basic. It's difficult to have the same expectations here as you do in other games, just due to the feeling of all the pacing being slightly off compared to what you may expect from a AAA. I enjoyed the game. I thought it was a blast. As you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system, and this is also on Game Pass. I would say Atomic Heart is definitely worth getting, even at the full price. I do not feel ripped off at all. It is something different, and for that, it is something to me that was highly enjoyable. In some way, if you think about it, it's like a virus. That's a part of a mechanism that provided for evolution. Games like Atomic Heart do the same in many ways for new gameplay elements in games moving forward. We've seen it so many times, and it's my hope a game like this slightly infects other titles and lets companies take a step back of that crowdsourced, group-funded lore bath that we get in all of these other open-world games. I would have liked more true immersive sim moments where you had more narrative to talk your way through something, but really, it's a bunch of robots that's sort of different. But it is different. It's huge. It's interesting. It's fun. And it grows and continues. And I got to say, every time I thought that game was sort of wrapping up or in some way not going to show me something bigger, it did. And that's the curve to Atomic Heart's experience that I think I enjoyed. When zoomed out, it looks smooth, but it's not always. Regardless of the issues, I fully enjoyed the game from start to finish. It has a very interesting world combat that didn't always work, but then when it did, felt good. And a story that actually had impact, even though sometimes I had to really concentrate on what they were trying to tell me. It doesn't resonate like a Bioshock or a Prey but instead really does have its own tone. In the best immersive sims, there really needs to be an almost surgical precision to the gameplay that isn't here in Atomic Heart, and you do feel that. But then it backs it up with just this world that is much larger than the immersive sims that we expect. Make no mistake, Atomic Heart is a different thing. Throws cumbersome creations of workmanship at you consistently, mixing in crystalline formations and liquid enemy designs, means that the language of the game stays just a bit alien throughout the entire time, and you're working through this game world always a little bit rocked back on your heels. So that's it for me. I hope you guys liked this review. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Check out the patron. Check out my Twitter at Jeremy Penner. And as you guys know, the worst boss in any kind of game is YouTube's algorithm. So hit the bell for notify all. Check out some of the videos. Maybe you'll see a video from me that you didn't necessarily think would come from a reviewer and you want to check it out. I promise you, I'll try not to waste your time. Peace out, gang gang. It's glowing. It's beautiful. The preliminary power generation phase has begun. <laughs> as a personal telephone set and headlight, but it also allows the user to get used to wearing it on their head. It, it's free, right? Absolutely. Allow me to connect you. All right, then.